Grace, mercy, and peace be to you and God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. A familiar quotation from God I'm sure we've all heard before and have probably had to say, or at least paraphrase, to someone else at some point in time. We all know he works in mysterious ways, after all, which means he very rarely works in exactly the ways we would expect, which again is something you see time and time again and whenever you review the ways he intervenes in human history throughout the whole of scriptures. And his message to King David in today's Old Testament reading is no exception. So here in 2 Samuel, David's at a pretty high point in his career. You might even say this is kind of like the pinnacle of his career. He has been, by now, he has been formally anointed as king of Judah. He has settled the civil war against the house of Saul, whose descendants thought they should inherit the throne, which means that now he's also been anointed king over a united Israel. He has captured the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites and has made it into the city of David, whereupon the king of Tyre sent him fine craftsmen and building materials to give him a nice house to welcome the new king of the region and probably try to curry some favor with the god who keeps delivering victory after victory to the new guy. After that nice house is built, the Lord gave him victory over the Philistines, who we all know have been enemies of the Israelites ever since they entered into the promised land. And upon conquering them, David had the Ark of the Covenant brought up to Jerusalem, to Zion, cementing it as the seat of both political and religious power in Israel. Who could ask for anything more? And so now, David, man after God's own heart that he is, reflects upon how blessed he has been by God, all of the victories that the Lord has delivered unto him. And in his thanksgiving, he recognizes the great injustice that he is now living in this fine house built out of the famous cedar from Lebanon, while the Lord and his ark remain in the tabernacle. Now, don't get me wrong. The tabernacle is a very nice tent. A lot of work went into the details of it. Half of the book of Exodus is just giving you instructions and detailing how it was manufactured. But it's still a tent. The scale doesn't seem to be very evenly balanced between fine house and tent. And so David resigns himself that with this wealth and power that he now has and recognizing that it was all given to him by God, he is now going to build an equally magnificent house for God, a temple where his glory may dwell as a testament to God's power and might and all that he has done for his people. And of course, that's how we expect the story should go, right? God raises a humble shepherd up to mighty king, and that faithful king now gives all thanks and glory to God in a grand act of service that will speak to all the people, that will show the honor that should be given to the Most High. It certainly made sense to the prophet Nathan, who upon hearing it, gave David the all clear, go ahead and do it. God will be with you in this endeavor. Now, while it's probably, we could say it's an unprofit like behavior of Nathan to speak for God without first receiving a word from God, it's understandable. Why would God object to a fine temple being built in his honor? Are we not supposed to give him praise and homage and grand structures to recognize his glories? You know, the tabernacle did have to be a tent because the Israelites had to be able to carry it along with them throughout their journey in the wilderness. But again, it was a very well-made tent put together by skilled artisans. Clearly, God wants the place where his presence is made known for the sake of worship to itself be a witness through grandeur of his majesty. But again, God doesn't always work the way we expect. And so he does some course correcting, giving Nathan a message to now bring to David about those plans regarding the temple. I'll work on my timeline, not yours. Thank you very much. I've been fine with the tabernacle for the last 500 years or so. If I really wanted a temple built for me by now, I would have told somebody, trust me. But this isn't just God being humble. A magnificent temple will be built for him with his blessing before too long after all. In fact, our our lectionary skips over a couple of verses in the reading, but if you read that part that was taken out, this is where God promises that David's son will be the one to build the temple. 
But for now, it's just, he's not done with David yet. Yes, I've lifted you up from a shepherd, the youngest of seven sons, into this great king over my people, but I will elevate you even more still. You think to build me a house? No, I will build you a house, a royal house, a dynasty. Through your descendants shall your throne be established forever. Now, this covenant sounds really good, and it is really good. It's amazing that after all that God has done for David, he's going to continue to do even more. But I suppose that also makes this passage all the more tragic when we look back in hindsight, knowing how David's story ends. We're in chapter 7 today, but it's not going to be too long till we get to chapter 11, which is when he commits adultery with Bathsheba. And the firstborn son from that union, the one whom perhaps David thought would be the fulfillment of his covenant, will die a week after he is born. The scandal of the whole thing will split up David's own household. It will plant the seeds of rebellion, and his older son Absalom will lead a revolt and try to steal David's throne. And while David will restore his kingdom, Absalom will die in the fight. And then his second son will be born of Bathsheba, named Solomon, and David names him to be heir. And indeed, Solomon now does seem to be the one to fulfill this prophecy. After all, Solomon is a mighty and successful king, wiser and richer than any other, and he is the one chosen to build the temple, and it is truly magnificent. But Solomon also falls from grace. His heart is given to his many wives and concubines, and they turn him away from worship of the true God. And so not only does he build the Lord's temple, but he also builds temples for Chemosh and Molech and Ashtoreth and other pagan gods. He plants the seeds of destruction within the kingdom of Israel, not just religiously, but politically as well. By the end of his life, his taxation policy will leave the people rather unhappy. And then when his son Rehoboam takes the throne and continues those policies, that's when you see the split between the northern and the southern kingdoms, and Israel is no longer united. And the Davidic fall from grace just continues from there, as bad king after bad king continues this legacy of idolatry and corruption, until eventually, eventually both halves of the kingdom fall to exile to Assyria and Babylon, respectively, until only a remnant can return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple Itself an event marked both with celebration and weeping because the people who had seen the first temple recognized that the second one will not live up to those expectations. And as, even though they're happy to be getting a temple, they are still mourning over what was lost in the first. And so as the years and the decades and the centuries go by, it looks like this covenant has fallen flat. Perhaps Nathan misspoke because David's dynasty has clearly ended. At least that's what human reckoning would say. But remember, God's ways are not our ways, and his timeline is not our own. Because almost a thousand years after this prophecy is given to David, in the fullness of time, that prophecy is realized. For there in the city of David, through the house and lineage of David, his descendant will be born, and in that birth, God will dwell in his great temple. In fact, if we're reading in John 1.14, that familiar verse that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, if you're reading it in Greek, that word dwelt is the same word that's used for the tabernacle. So the Son of God, who is also the Son of David, tabernacled among us. He is that new temple, the place where God dwells with his people to reveal him to the nations. Through him, this covenant is fulfilled because in Christ, the enemies of God are cut off. The people of God find their refuge and the throne and kingdom of heaven through that house and line of David is made sure forever. And I think it's worthwhile that we meditate on this divine timeline and the unexpectedness of the ways that God works as we straddle our, this weird event this year where today is both the fourth Sunday of Advent and Christmas Eve. And so as we are eagerly awaiting his arrival in our celebrations in tonight's service, as we rejoice that we're finally leaving the penitential season aside for the joy of Christmas in about nine hours, 
all the while waiting for the full joy of the full realization of the kingdom of heaven when he arrives for the second time. We need to remember that that fullness of time comes to us by God's reckoning and not our own. So for those of us who have been facing hardships this year, whether it's stress at work, mourning the loved ones who have departed, just familial strife in the household that keeps you from getting into the Christmas spirit, for those who maybe get, go a little too on board with the penitential season of Advent and you're rightly mourning your fallenness and starting to wonder how God could become an heart incarnate to save a poor, wretched sinner as yourself, and I don't mean to call anyone out, quite frankly, that's where I am most of the time. Let us find our hope and reassurance in this covenant made to David that we read today. Let us remember that even through those spectacular falls from grace that David and his heirs experienced, God never fully departed from this promise. Let us remember that David himself was forgiven in his repentance. And so God did preserve his line so that this covenant would be fulfilled. Let us remember, as we celebrate tonight, that Jesus does, did come into the world as David's son and David's Lord, so that through him all might be brought into that great heavenly kingdom. The greater temple, better than the tabernacle, better than Solomon's temple, came to us for our sake to establish God's rule and reign for all eternity. So let us rejoice in him now and always as we prepare to welcome that holy infant and remembering his nativity tonight. And as we await that second coming, whenever it may be, all the while fully trusting that God knows what he's doing, that he has planned history for the good of those who love him, and remembering that it's probably not going to look the way we expect, and our lives are still going to be chaotic and unpredictable, but remember that he is with us. He is watching over us. He is coming for us. So let us now wait on him with the same hope, with the knowledge that he is now and forever your king. And in his kingdom, he will bless you as one whom he has chosen. And that kingdom will never end. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until the life everlasting. Amen.